Welcome back, Young Scholars. In this video, we've been discussing the Russian Empire, and we'll be catching up on basically a thousand years of Russian history very quickly. We're going to go all the way back to period three and discuss the origins of Russia, and then we're going to carry it all the way really through period five. So the big questions that we should be able to answer after watching this video are first, how was Russia influenced by the traditions of the Byzantines and Western Europe? And then how did Russia go from a collection of small cities to a massive land-based empire spanning nearly all of Eurasia? So how was Russia influenced by the traditions of the Byzantines in Western Europe? So the first question I guess I want to ask is, why did Winston Churchill call Russia a riddle wrapped in a mystery and cited an enigma? Why is Russia so mysterious? And I think it has to do with the nature of Russia. Russia, in many respects, is the world's last significant empire. I mean, it's incredibly large, it's very diverse, and there is one single central ruler who has a significant amount of power. Now, how diverse is it? Well, well there are many different ethnic groups that are spread out across Russia. I mean, we're dealing with Slavic people over in this region of Russia. We have Turks. We have predominantly uninhabited regions of Siberia up here. And so it's an incredibly diverse place in terms of its ethnic composition, in terms of its linguistic composition, in terms of its geography. And therefore, it's really hard to pin down what is Russia. And I think that's what the answer to this question is. So in terms of the origins of Russia, Russia began as a loose federation of Slavic or Viking tribes that formed between 882 and 1240 CE in what is now kind of Eastern Europe, Western Asia. And so you may recall the Vikings from Scandinavia were sailing up rivers in order to engage in both conquest but also trade. And so there's some evidence that many Viking traders settled on the, the shores of where they began to be, mix with some Slavic people that were already located in that region. And we're going to call the collection of tribes the Kievian Rus. So the Kievian Rus was a collection of tribes that forms what will eventually become Russia. And again, it's over in this region of what is Eastern Europe. So the story of Russia really begins with a ruler named Vladimir. So Vladimir was seeking out ways in order to unify the Rus. The Rus were just a patchwork of various groups and tribes. And so Vladimir understood that religion was one of those things that ultimately could bring these decentralized tribes and clans together. So he sent out emissaries to spend some time and study the various major world religions. So he spent time studying the Islamic world, right? This is a period around 900 CE where Islam is initially spreading. However, he had issues with Islam because in Islam there was a prohibition on drinking alcohol. So as he says, drinking is the joy of the roost. We cannot go without it. So they reject the idea of Islam. They consider Judaism. The problem that Vladimir saw, though, again, Judaism at this point was widely dispersed. There was the Jewish diaspora. Even the Jews' own homeland was at that point controlled by Muslims. And so they reject Judaism as an option. Christianity is another obvious option. But at this point, again, Christianity was beginning to really split between the Roman Catholic faith and the Eastern Orthodox faith. And so Vladimir sends some diplomats to Constantinople. They walk into the Hagia Sophia, this magnificent church, and they're just blown away by it. And so Vladimir is quoted as saying something along the lines of like, you know, is this heaven? No, it's Constantinople. So ultimately in 987 CE, Prince Vladimir converts to Eastern Orthodox Christianity, the religion of the Byzantine people. Again, this is our first example of a Byzantine influence. And this ultimately is going to unify the region through religion. And we've seen this before with previous political rulers like Constantine spreading Christianity across the Roman Empire, like Ashoka and spreading Buddhism across India. So here we can see Vladimir being baptized with his little bottle. The Byzantine Empire, however, is going to collapse in 1453 with the conquest of Constantinople by Ottoman Turks. And so when Constantinople falls, Moscow really then becomes the center of the Eastern Orthodox Church. And some people refer to this as the Third Rome. Right? The first Rome is Rome, the second Rome is Constantinople, and the third Rome is Moscow. And you can see a lot of the connections between 
the initial Roman Empire, and then the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, and, and Russia. You can see it in their architecture with these, you know, onion domes. We talked about domed architecture as being a characteristic of, kind of the Roman Empire. In 1241 CE, the Kievian Rus is going to be invaded by the Mongols, right? As the Mongol horde is doing their destruction and their conquest, they are going to spread into the region that will one day become Russia. So from 1241 to 1502, so the Mongols actually ruled Russia for a significantly longer period of time than they were able to maintain control over China or the Ilkhanate. So they ruled Russia under the Khanate of the Golden Horde from 1241 to 1502. And you may recall they set up a tributary system where these various princes were forced to pay tribute and recognize the kind of superiority of the Mongols. In exchange, the Mongols would continuously conquer them. So fighting against the Mongols, though, ultimately is going to help unify the Russian people. And that desire to end this parasitic relationship that the Mongols had on the host Russian people. This relationship really comes to an end with Ivan the Third or Ivan the Great. He was the Grand Prince of Muscovy, which was the kingdom around Moscow that is increasingly growing in kind of power and wealth. And Ivan the Third was incredibly powerful because he was collecting tribute on behalf of the Mongols. And ultimately, he just was looking around going, mm, the Mongols are becoming increasingly weak. We don't have to pay them tribute anymore. And so he refuses to pay the tribute, and he ultimately declares himself czar. And that's just going to be an important term, again, because he's looking to the model of the Byzantine Empire. And so that word czar derives from the word Caesar, which again was part of the Eastern Roman Empire tradition, the Byzantine tradition, which had started in the Roman Empire back in the Classical Age. Now, another leader that you need to be aware of is Ivan IV or Ivan the Terrible. So he is in many ways very paranoid. He is going to kill anyone who he views as a threat to his power, which included Russian nobility, which are known as boyars. So in Russia, again, there would be this system of entitled nobility landowners who are known as boyars. So he viewed them increasingly as a threat, and he was very paranoid. And so he had this secret police force created called the Oprichnina. And you can see here they would ride around on these horses with dog heads, which was symbolic of sniffing out anyone who wasn't loyal. And then they would take these brooms and sweep them away. So it was very symbolic. These this sort of secret police uh, engaged in all kinds of very brutal tactics, however. And he also was so paranoid that he ultimately killed his own son. One of the reasons he's known as Ivan the Terrible. He viewed his son ultimately as a threat to his own power. And so in a fit of kind of madness or rage, he ended up killing his own son. So Ivan the Terrible is important because he is going to establish the role of Tsar as a strong, absolute ruler. This should sound familiar to you. The Roman Caesar ultimately becoming the Roman Tsar. Again, the Roman Caesar, a very strong, centralized, absolute ruler. This eventually will translate down in Russian history. Later on, we'll talk about Stalin and some of the tactics that Stalin used. Very similar to this with you know, secret police and rounding up people who weren't loyal to you know, his communist government. And then ultimately today, <laughs> with Vladimir Putin, you know, who rides around on bears, or maybe it's just horses. We can't say anything mean about Putin other than, man, look at that bare chest. Yeah, we wouldn't want any of his like spies or bots coming after us. So I'll have a very adorable picture of him with a St. Bernard. So the Romanov dynasty is going to take power then in Russia following Ivan IV's death. So really from about the 1600s all the way up until the 1900s, the 20th century, the Romanov dynasty is in power. So the Romanov dynasty is going to stay in power all the way up until the Russian Revolution of 1917. So one of the Romanov czars that you should be familiar with is Peter the Great, who ruled Russia from 1682 to 1725. Now Peter the Great wanted to westernize Russia. He wanted to make Russia look more like this emerging European power. And so he did this in a number of ways. One, he moved the capital west, physically west, from Moscow to St. Petersburg, which was one of the only warm water ports that was 
accessible to the Russians at the time. He also is going to build up his naval forces, seeing the model of the Europeans and how they were building these ships in order to engage in exploration and colonization. He wanted to follow that lead. He also gave some unique orders. For instance, he ordered all men to shave off their beards, beards being pretty traditional in the Eastern Orthodox faith. But again, he looked at the model of Europe, and in Europe there was a Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church, far fewer beards. So he required men to cut off their beards. It was a way in which he was trying to westernize Russia. He also was going to expand Russia south into what is the modern-day region of Crimea here in order to get access to warm water ports in the Black Sea. And this is important today because very recently, in the past few years, Russia again has attempted to occupy that region. And so there are pro-Russian forces right now in Crimea who ultimately are in control of that area. Uh, and there's conflict between these pro-Russian forces in Crimea and the Ukraine. We can see Peter's attempts at westernization in examples like this. This is the palace that he built at St. Petersburg, and you can see how similar it is to the palace that was built by Louis outside of Paris called Versailles. This period, period four, we sometimes refer to this as the age of absolutism because there are rulers that have an exceptional amount of power. And you can see that rulers were utilizing different methods to legitimate their power by building these massive palaces. Now, another Russian Tsarina that you should be familiar with is Catherine the Great. She rules Russia from 1762 to 1796, so she's in period five. Now, she is initially going to seek to reform treatment of the serfs. And we'll talk more about the serfs in a second, but they are the peasant laboring class in Russia. So she's going to give instructions like this. The equality of the citizens consists in this, that they should all be subject to the same laws. This equality requires institutions as to prevent the rich from oppressing those who are not so wealthy as themselves. Well, who's going to be attracted to this kind of message, right? The serfs. They, they see this as, as a window for uh, you know an opportunity to gain greater equality in their society. The problem, of course, is who's going to not like this? Well, you have your wealthy landowners, your boyars, who is going to respond very negatively to this, this idea that maybe uh, Catherine is attempting to free the serfs is not going to go over well. So ultimately, she is going to back down as there are increasing challenges to her rule by these boyars that she feels threatened by. Her interest in social reform ultimately will diminish. So during the Romanov dynasty, peasant freedoms are increasingly restricted as peasants become tied to the land as serfs. We've used that term serfs before. It's a form of coerced labor in the context of medieval Europe. Well, in Russia, here is your basic uh, pyramid hierarchy with czars at the top, and then boyars, these wealthy landowning class, and then your merchants. And at the very bottom, again, you have these peasants just or serfs, uh, you know, people engaged in, in widespread farming. So serfs are going to provide landlords with labor. Uh, they ultimately can't marry or move away without the landlord's permission. And so this is a form of coarse labor. It's not quite chattel slavery because serfs oftentimes get to keep a portion of their labor, a portion of the crops that they grow, they get to keep, uh, while at the same time having to turn over the vast majority of crops to their landowner. So serfdom ended in Western Europe in the 16th century, but ultimately it's going to continue in Russia until the 19th century. Serfdom is officially abolished in Russia in 1860, uh, right around the almost exact same time that slavery was abolished in the United States. So over time, the Russian Empire is going to expand outwards, really from its hub of Moscow. So we see it expanding across Siberia, and then ultimately further into Eastern Europe, forming a vast, diverse, and singularly centrally ruled empire. So during the first global age, Russia expands across Siberia, and ultimately all the way over across the Pacific and into Alaska. They establish colonies over here in Alaska. Now, why are they so interested in expanding across Siberia? Well, there's a resource in Siberia that was very valuable in period four, and that's furs, soft gold. And ultimately, the Russians are going to require some of these nomadic peoples, these people who are living more as hunter-gatherers, living out in Siberia, to pay tribute in the form of, of furs. So the big questions you should be able to answer after watching this video are, first, how was Russia influenced by the traditions of the Byzantines in Western Europe? And then second, how did Russia grow from a collection of small city-states to a massive land-based empire spanning nearly all of Eurasia? Thanks for watching.
and based empire, spanning nearly all of Eurasia. So how was Russia influenced by the traditions of the Byzantines in Western Europe? So the first question I guess I want to ask is, why did Winston Churchill call Russia a riddle wrapped in a mystery and cited an enigma? Why is Russia so mysterious? And I think... Welcome back, Young Scholars. In this video, we've been discussing the Russian Empire, and we'll be catching up on basically a thousand years of Russian history very quickly. We're going to go all the way back to period three. It has to do with the nature of Russia. Russia, in many respects, is the world's last significant empire. I mean, it's incredibly large, it's very diverse, and there is one single central ruler who has a significant amount of power. And discuss the origins of Russia, and then we're going to carry it all the way really through period five. So the big questions that we should be able to answer after watching this video are first, how was Russia influenced by the traditions of the Byzantines and Western Europe? And then how did Russia go from a collection of small cities to a massive land?